This video is another in this series from Math 1224 for UTSA. Today we're talking about 6.3, Taylor and Maclaurin series. So rather than jumping right into definitions and formulas, I want to start with a, a somewhat concrete example to make, to give a big picture of the whole thing. So we're going to find a power series representation for f of x equals e to the x centered at x equals 0. So how do we do that? Well, of course, we're going to assume that there is a power series. Let's say that uh, e to the x equals the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of some coefficient sequence c sub n times x to the n. There's some coefficient sequence that will do this, right? So this would look like c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared plus c3x cubed plus c4 x to the fourth, and so on. So, ta ta ta. There's a couple, there, well, there's two basic pieces of information we need to, to figure out what those uh, c values should be. The first thing is, when x is 0, so e to the 0 power, of course, e to the 0 is 1, right? Well, we're going to get c0 plus c1 times 0 plus c2 times 0 squared plus c3 times 0 cubed, and so forth. So this is just c0. So c0 is equal to 1. That's the first thing, OK? Now, the other thing that we need is the derivative of this function and power series, because of course, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So yeah, let's say e to the x equals d dx of e to the x. Okay, and so this is going to be, of course, the derivative of the power series, which I will, I'll use this version of it. So this will be n equals 0 to infinity of c sub n times x to the n, and we'll just do the term by term derivative. This will be the series n goes from 0 to infinity of c sub n times n times x to the n minus 1 power, OK? So when n is uh, 0, well, of course, this is a 0 here. So we'll get 0 for that term. So 0, if we want, plus, well, when n is 1, we'll have c1 times 1 times x to the 0 power, which would be 1. So c, uh, c1 times 1 times 1, so c1 plus, so c2 times 2 times x to the first power, plus c3 times 3 times x squared, and so forth. Okay, now this is all equal to this series that we started with. So this equals c0 plus c1 times x plus c2 times x squared plus c3 times x cubed plus dot, dot, dot. We're actually missing a term that, that I'd like to be able to fit in here. So I'm going to resize things a little bit. So um, let's do this. Yeah, that, that's a lot of fit. Let's do one more term over here. So c4 times 4 times x cubed plus dot, dot, dot. So, Think back to when we did partial fraction decompositions and we were solving for coefficients, um, say ABC, for example, in the partial fraction decomposition, the, the coefficients of the numerators. And we'd have two polynomials that were equal. So for any x value, these would be the same thing. And uh, what that means is the coefficients have to be the same. So this constant coefficient has to equal this constant coefficient. This linear coefficient has to equal this linear coefficient, and so on. This quadratic coefficient has to equal this quadratic coefficient. Okay, So what we get from that is the following. I get, of course, the 0 doesn't matter. I get that c0 equals c1. And of course, we already know that c0 is 1. I get that c1 equals c2 times 2. C2 equals C3 times 3. C3 equals C4 times 4. And we could continue this pattern. It holds up. C4 equals C5 times 5, for example. 
if I take these and rearrange them a little bit, basically uh, divide by the appropriate value on each side, then I will get the following. I will get that uh, C1 equals C0, C2 equals one half of C1, C3 equals one third of C2, C4 equals one fourth of C3, C5 equals one fifth of C4. If we keep this pattern up, what we find is the following, that Cn equals one over n times Cn minus one for whenever uh, n is greater than or equal to one. Of course, C0 we already know. So this is a recursive definition for the, the sequence. And if you think about it, C, well, C3 is one third times C2, but C2 is one half times C1. So this could be rewritten as one third times one half C0. And then C4 is, of course, one fourth of C3, but C3 is one third of one half of C0. So this would be one over four times one over three times one over two C zero. So it turns out that CN equals one over N factorial times C zero. Now C zero we already found is one. So CN equals one over N factorial. So there's the closed form version of that sequence. Okay, so we're gonna get that E to the X equals the series and goes from zero to infinity of one over n factorial. You might think, well, hold on a second. What about zero? Well, remember zero factorial is one, so that's okay. Times x to the n, okay? Now this is called the Maclaurin series for e to the x. We'll get, get into more detail on that later. Okay, this is basically a power series representation for e to the x, we could think about, do we have room? Eh, I got a little bit of room. We could think about what is the radius of convergence if we wanted to. So I could look for uh, rho, to do the, the ratio test, rho equals the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of one over n plus one factorial times x to the n plus one over one over n factorial times x to the n. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of n factorial over n plus one factorial. And really the, the denominator, I should write as n plus one times n factorial. Might as well do that all in one go, uh, times x. Okay, the x can move out in front. This is the absolute value of x times the limit as n goes to infinity of one over one plus n, or n plus one rather, same thing. So of course this limit is zero. So it turns out for any x, this series converges. So this works for any x value. Anyway, that's just our first example. And we're not going to go through this procedure for all of them. I just wanted to motivate that you can do this. And in fact, I wanted to motivate, or more specifically, the um, the the presence of the factorial. Like, where does that come from? Because we're not going to do this for all of them. So I just want to show one example. So before we go on from here, I want to take a look at what the graphs of this look like. Okay, so here I have y equals e to the x. And here I have... Uh, the zeroth uh, term. So this is just y equals one, right? So if I increase big N, and I look at say the linear, um, the linear up to, up to the linear term, so the, the first partial sum, uh, and then I can increase that and do more terms and see that, yeah, this seems to match the graph really well. And it goes out to like negative 20 when you have 50, uh, degree 50 when big N is 50. And if we did more of this, this um, this section here would move out farther to the left. Uh, Desmos does not really like to do more than that. Let's try to get it to do, let's go with 60, see how it handles it. it it's gonna start bogging down though. So let's move this over. And you'll see that this um, 
place where the graph matches goes further. Yeah, I went a little bit further, see? And of course, we did like 100 terms that would go further than that. So what's the general idea? If f is a smooth function at x equals a, the Taylor series of f at a is the following. What does smooth mean? Smooth just means that every derivative exists. So the first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, and so forth. You can keep finding derivatives, and you never run out of derivatives. That's required for uh, the formula to work, basically. The, the series then goes from 0 to infinity of the nth derivative of f evaluated at a over n factorial times x minus a to the n power. I think this part's pretty familiar. This is just this is just uh, an element of any power series centered at a. So it's really this coefficient that's that's notable. Okay. In our first example, I used e to the x because e to the zero is one, and the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So it worked out really relatively simply. In the previous example, this numerator here is just one all the time. That's why that showed up. And of course, we centered it at zero, which made things a little bit simpler. So the first term is f of a, which you may recognize as, oh, that's just the function value. The second term is f prime of a times x minus a. And you might notice, hey, wait a minute, this is the linear approximation. This is the tangent line, which is totally true. When you use just two terms, you're doing the linear approximation. Some books, when they talk about the linear approximation, will also automatically talk about the quadratic approximation. The next term is f double prime of a over 2 factorial, or in other words, over 2, times x minus a squared. So this is a quadratic function which approximates the original function. If you add another term, you'll get a cubic function, so forth. We'll talk about Taylor polynomials later. So uh, the Taylor series that is centered at 0 is called the Maclaurin series, which is what our first example was. It is given by the following formula, which is just this restated with 0 instead of a. So the series then goes from 0 to infinity of the nth derivative of the function evaluated at 0 divided by n factorial times x to the n power. Okay, And the terms go f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial times x plus f triple prime of 0 over 3 factorial times x cubed and so forth. I may have said just x. Here I'm at x squared, of course, for that term. So uniqueness. If a function f has a power series representation centered at a with r greater than zero, then that power series is the Taylor series of f at a. So up here, that's saying that this power series, even though I didn't use the formula to find it, this is the Taylor series, right? And specifically the Maclaurin series. This is the Maclaurin series, regardless of how I found it, because this converges, uh, it has an interval of convergence. The radius is not zero. Therefore, it is the Maclaurin series. And if you were to find a different series that looks different, it's actually equivalent in, in the, you know, the, the series as n goes to infinity. It's actually the same thing. So Taylor polynomials, uh, which is what I alluded to a moment ago. So if f has n derivatives, and n could be 1 or 2 or 10 or whatever, and x equals a, then the nth Taylor polynomial of f at a is p sub n of x. Well, this is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a dot 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 dot, dot all the way up to f the nth derivative of f evaluated a over n factorial times x minus a to the n power. This is just the general term of the Taylor series. So if you stop at n terms, what you're really finding is the nth partial sum of the Taylor series. So the nth partial sum is called the nth Taylor polynomial because you're adding up terms of a power series. And it's a finite list, so it's called a polynomial. If a equals 0, then this is called the nth Maclaurin polynomial. Okay, let's look at some examples. So we're going to find the first four Taylor polynomials for f of x equals 1 over x at x equals 1. So I'm going to need, depending on how you count, I'm going to start counting with, um, we're going to start with 0, but 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we'll say that the 0th Taylor polynomial is n equals 0. And the 4th Taylor polynomial, that's n equals 4. Let's, let's go with that uh, standard. So I'm going to need the first four derivatives. So f of x I can write this as x to the negative 1 power. That may be helpful. Okay, So f prime of x, this will be negative x to the negative 2 power. f double prime of x, this will be uh, 2 times x to the negative 3 power. f triple prime of x, this will be negative 6 times x to the negative 4 power. And then f, the fourth derivative of x, will be uh, 24x to the negative 5th power. Okay, so I'm going to need 
the coefficients of the polynomials from these functions evaluated at 1. So f of 1, this is going to be, well, 1. f of 2, or rather, sorry, f prime of 1, I mean to say, this will be a negative 1. f double prime of 1, this will be 2. f triple prime of 1, this will be negative 6. And the fourth derivative evaluated at 1, this will be 24. So these are the numerators in the form f nth derivative evaluated at 1 over n factorial times x minus 1 to the n power. Okay, so am I going to find the, find the, uh, the zeroth polynomial, p0 of x? Well, this is just 1. It's, it's just the first coefficient. It's a constant function. Typically, we wouldn't use that, but that's what it is. So then p1, well, this is going to be the linearization. So this will be f of 1 plus f prime of 1 times x minus 1. So 1 minus 1 times x minus 1. Or if you uh, distribute that and combine like terms, negative x plus 2. Okay. So the next polynomial, p2, this will be the quadratic. So this will be f of 1 plus f prime of 1 times x minus 1 plus f double prime of 1 over 2, 2 factorial is 2, times x minus 1 squared. Okay, so this will be 1 minus 1 times x minus 1. And of course, I could recycle what I've already done up here, right? Plus, well, f double prime of 1 was 2, 2 over 2, that's convenient, times x minus 1 squared. So this is, um, I will recycle this. So this is negative x plus 2, that's, that's from these first two terms. And then, of course, 2 over 2 is 1, it's convenient. And then I'll foil this out, so x squared minus 2x plus 1. So this will be, if I put this in descending order, x squared minus 3x plus 1. Okay. So the third one, p3 of x, this will equal, uh, I'm going to get a little bit lazy. I'm going to say, oh, well, this is a, well, let's do it this way. f1 plus f prime of 1 times x minus 1 plus f double prime of 1 over 2 times x minus 1 squared. We'll defer laziness for a second. f triple prime, triple prime of 1 over 3 factorial times x minus 1 cubed. So I know that all this here totals x cubed, uh, x squared minus 3x plus 1. So let's do that. So x squared minus 3x plus 1 plus, and then we'll just deal with this. So f triple prime of 1 over, that's negative 6 over 6. So that's convenient that that works out relatively simply. Times, well, this is going to be, cutting corners a little bit, x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1. And of course, negative 6 over 6 is negative 1, so we're negating all of that. So do we, how much room do we have? Okay, we're running out of room. So x squared minus 3x plus 1 minus x cubed plus 3x squared minus 3x plus 1. Combine like terms, I get minus x cubed plus 4x squared minus 6x plus 2. I'm going to pause the video here and, and make more room. Okay, so let's do the last one. So p4 of x, this equals f1 plus f prime of 1 times x minus 1. And you might be wondering, well, why, why am I writing these as fractions? Well, this is really over 0 factorial, and this one's over 1 factorial. But, of course, those values are both 1. So I didn't bother writing them before plus f double prime of 1 over 2 times x minus 1 squared plus f triple prime 
4 over 3 factorial times x minus 1 cubed. Are we going to have room? Let's make some more. Plus f quadruple prime, or in other words, why should rise that notation there over 4 factorial times x minus 1 to the fourth. So I know all of this is the, the polynomial we just found, so I'll save myself some effort and just use that. I guess it's not lazy since I did it, but I'm just um, saving some effort. So plus the fourth derivative evaluate at 1, that was 24. So 24 over 4 factorial, so 24 over 24, right? Times, so this guy, this is going to be x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 6x squared, rather, minus 4x plus 1. Okay, so this is just 1 as a coefficient, so I'm really just dropping that and then combining like terms. So I'll get x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 10x squared minus 10x plus 3. And I just noticed that I had a mistake, which some of you might have noticed. This is supposed to be a 5, and this is supposed to be a 4. This is supposed to be a 3, and the reason is I forgot about this plus 2 here. Let's go back and fix all that, all right? 2 plus 1 makes 3, not 1. Okay, so... So, let's do this. Uh, 3, 4, 5. Why did I notice that? Well, basically I've memorized this pattern. Uh, well, this pattern, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And you might notice uh, 1, 4, 6, 4, right? It's a, it's a similar pattern. So when I got down here, it's supposed to go 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, and I didn't get a 5. So, oh, that's a mistake. Anyway, so we've got some polynomials. Let's go take a look at what, what they look like um, and see how this relates to, to the function itself. So I've got a function here, y equals 1 over x. And here, uh, Desmos wants to make this a slider, but it's, it's just 1. So if I look at y equals 1, this was p0, okay? Now, if I put that away and get p1, I get a linear function. And notice that it touches the function here at 1, 1. If I look at p2, I get a quadratic that approximates the function. If I look at p3, I get a cubic that approximates the function. If I look at p4, I get a quartic that approximates the function. Of course, the color is also red. If we went from p5, we'd get a degree 5 that approximates, and so forth. So as you move through higher and higher degree polynomials, you're getting polynomials that approximate the function better and better. Okay, so let's go look at the next thing. So we're going to find the first four Maclaurin polynomials for sine of x. And since these are Maclaurin polynomials, we're going to be using... Uh, a equals zero, so we'll have like x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. We won't have to deal with foiling. Uh, that was pretty tedious on that one. We won't have to do that with this one. So I'm going to need some derivatives. Um, of course, we're going to use f of x is the, uh, let's put it this way. In the notation, this notation, when n is zero, the zeroth derivative just refers to a fu the function itself, not any derivative. So the zeroth derivative is just the function itself. Okay, so f prime of x, the first derivative, will of course be cosine. f double prime of x will of course be negative sine x. The third derivative will of course be negative cosine x. And then the fourth derivative, conveniently enough, this will be sine of x. So, f of 0 is 0, f prime of 0 is 1, f double prime of 0 is 0, f triple prime of 0 is negative 1, and f, the fourth derivative, value at 0, this will be 0. You know, let's go do one more term, because this one's kind of boring. Let's do... um. 
Let's do the first five instead. Then think about that when I wrote this problem out. So f, fifth derivative of x, this will be cosine of x. So the fifth derivative evaluated at zero will be one. Okay. So remember, we're using this formula, the nth derivative evaluated at zero over n factorial times x to the n. Okay, so the zeroth polynomial, well, that's just that number, zero. So pretty boring. The first polynomial, well, this will be the, the linear made out of these coefficients. So this will be zero plus one times x minus zero if you want, or just x. So this is just x. P2, well, this will be those first two terms plus uh, f double prime zero over two factorial times x squared. So zero. So this is again just x, okay? So p3, well, this will be zero plus one times x plus zero times x squared plus negative one over three factorial times x cubed. Or in other words, this will be x, well, actually I can put it here, x, minus 1 over 6x cubed, okay? So p4, well, that's boring because this coefficient is 0. So this just equals p3. Just cut to the chase on that one. So p5, this will be basically p3 plus the next term. But I'll, I'll write this out. So 0 plus 1 times x plus 0 uh, minus 1 over 6x cubed plus 0 plus 1 over, because 1 is the numerator, 5 factorial x to the fifth. So we can write this as x minus 1 over 6x cubed plus 1 over 120x to the fifth. Okay, so let's look at um, what that looks like. So here's the sine function. Here is the uh, constant approximation. It turns out to be a straight line, of course, it's a constant function, but degree zero. Here is the degree one approximation, straight line, slope one, right? It's, it's better of an approximation. And then here's the degree three approximation. So it approximates significantly better uh, farther away from the origin. Here's the degree five approximation. You can see how past pi over two, it's quite accurate. If we look at all these together, here is deg degree zero, degree one, degree three, degree five. If we zoom in, you can see that the degree five approximation is more accurate farther out along the domain of the function. The degree three is accurate up to a point. The degree five is accurate farther out. And that's gonna hold up. So the degree seven approximation would be better farther from the origin and, and so forth. Okay, what's next? So representing functions with Taylor and Maclaurin series, not just the polynomials as an approximation, but using a series representation that gives you the function value. Find the Taylor series for f of x equals one over three x at x equals three and find the interval and radius of convergence. Okay, so we're gonna need to find some derivatives and look for a pattern because we want to have this full series representation, not just the polynomial. So of course, um, I guess to make this easier, we will do this. Get the function, and I think what we'll do is we'll start by, yeah, we'll just leave it at is, as is, that's fine. Okay, so f prime of x, well, that will be negative one over three x squared. f double prime of x, that will be two over three x cubed f triple prime of x that will be negative six but i'll write this as negative two times three you'll see why in a moment over three x to the fourth let's do i think let's do two more the fourth derivative 
of x. Well, this is going to be 2 times 3 times 4 over 3x to the fifth. Maybe that's enough. Let's do one more, just to be sure. So the fifth derivative, this will be negative 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 all over 3x to the 6th. Okay, so now I want to evaluate these at 3. Okay, so f of 3 is, of course, 1 over 9, but I'm going to write that as 1 over 3 squared. Again, this will become more obvious in a, in a minute. You know, why am I doing it this way? So then f prime of 3, this will be negative 1 over 3 cubed f double prime of 3. So this will be 2 over 3 to the 4th. f triple prime of 3. This will be negative 2 times 3, which I will, I will not write as 6. I'll leave it the way it is, over 3 to the 5th. And I'm not going to reduce. Of course, these 3s could cancel, but I'm going to leave them as is. And you might say, well, why are you doing that? Well, I'm looking for a pattern. And when you have parts that could cancel, you're going to lose information about the pattern. So I don't want to cancel or reduce anything. I want all the pieces still there. So this will be at 2 times 3 times 4 over 3 to the 6th power. And then the 5th derivative evaluated at 3. This will be negative 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, all over 3 to the 7. And I'm noticing a pattern. Maybe you are too. The, the, the denominator just gets more copies of 3, right? So maybe, maybe the bottom is 3 to the end, something like that. The numerator grows sort of. It alternates plus, minus, plus, minus, right? Plus, 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 minus, minus, minus. It alternates. So there's a negative 1 to the n power somewhere in there, or n plus 1 perhaps. But then also in the numerator, I'm getting new factors of differing values. I've got a 2, then I've got a 3, then I have a 4, then I have a 5. Shape. So maybe the numerator has an n factorial somewhere in there. And there's a little bit of guesswork. You just have to try out, you know, I notice these elements. You just sort of start building a formula, and then you try out some, some values for n and see if they match up to what you're supposed to be getting. So it looks to me like I've got negative 1 to the n power times n factorial, and we'll check that that's right in a moment, over 3 to the n uh, plus 2, not just to the n, but n plus 2. And you don't have to notice this right away, but I noticed that um, we've got 3 to the 7th here on, on the 5th derivative, 3 to the 6th here on the 4th derivative, so the exponent is 2 more than the index that I'm currently working with. Okay. And of course, the factorial is up to 5 here. Well, we're on the fifth one. The factorial is up to 4 on this one. We're on the fourth one. Okay. Um, also, I want to check, is this, is this exponent supposed to be n or n plus 1? Well, when the index is 2, I have a positive value. When the index is 3, I have a negative value. So yeah, this, this is correct. The exponent is n, not n plus 1. Okay, so there we go. That's the formula. And, and notice that this is this is the nth derivative of value three. Okay, this is not the entire coefficient; it's just part of it. So that means that one over three to the x equals the series n goes from zero to infinity of well that whole thing over n factorial. So negative 1 to the n power times n factorial over 3 to the n plus 2 power times x minus 3 to the n power. And it might be pretty obvious to you that we get some cancellation here. And there's other stuff we could do. Um, I'm. Let's do it this way. I'll give a couple of options because there's more than one thing, more than one way to write this. So the most obvious simplification is canceling those factorials when we get this. Uh, negative 1 to the n 
over 3 to the n plus 2 power, all that times x minus 3 to the n. But you might notice I have two exponential expressions with the same base. So I could multiply those together and get 3 minus x to the n if I want to. That's an option. But then this doesn't have the format of the, the power series we're used to. So eh, maybe we don't need to do that. So let's, um, let's do two things. Let's first go look at... So let's go look at what these partial sums look like. Okay, so there's the function 1 over 3x. I've typed in the formula, and I went ahead and made this 3 minus x to the n power, but that's, that's fine. So as I increase n, the, the uh, partial sum function gets closer and closer and closer. Desmos is having a little bit of trouble calculating here, but you can see that, yeah, it's, it's pretty close, right? And it looks like the interval is maybe 0 to 6 or 6 point something, right? Maybe 6. So let's go look at the interval of uh, convergence. Okay, so how do we find the interval of convergence? Well, basically, we're just going to use um, the ratio test. So rho equals the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of big fraction negative 1 to the n plus 1 power over 3 to the n plus 2 power, uh, 3, n plus 3 power, right, if I'm putting plus 1 in for, for n, times x minus 3 to the n plus 1 power over negative 1 to the n power over 3 uh, to the n plus 2 power times x minus 3 to the n power, okay, we get some cancellation from that, but let's, let's write out this way. This is the limit as n goes to infinity, just to make the cancellation more obvious. Um, that will be negative 1, the n plus 1 power over negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n plus 2 power over 3 to the n plus 3 power times, well, that's just going to be x minus 3. That's already been kind of worked out. So this will equal the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of, well, negative 1. Okay, so that ends up going away. Times 1 third times x minus 3. Okay, so the x minus 3 and the 1 third can move out in front. So this is the absolute value of x minus 3 all over 3 times the limit as n goes to infinity of, well, 1, right? Which, that's just 1. So this equals absolute value of x minus 3 all over 3. And we need this to be less than 1 to have convergence. So, negative 1 is less than x minus 3 over 3, which is less than 1. Multiply 3 on uh, all components. So negative 3 is less than x minus 3. So less than 3. So this tells me that the center is 3. Of course, we knew that. And the radius is 3. I can add 3 to all components. Get 0 is less than x is less than 6. So the radius is 3. And the interval is 0 to 6, as, as the graph seemed to indicate. OK, what's next? Find the Maclaurin series for f of x equals ln of 3 minus x and find the interval of convergence. Okay. So, uh, much like with the previous one, we're going to start by finding derivatives. Uh, I'll first start by just repeating the function because we're going to need to know that. Well, we'll need to reuse it and we'll keep the pattern up. It's more what I mean. So f prime of x, well, using the chain rule, I get 1 over 3 minus x uh, times negative 1. So I'll put the negative in the top. f double prime. of x equals, well, just using the power rule in the chain rule, I'm going to have negative 1 over 3 minus x squared times negative 1 times negative 1. So the, the two negatives cancel each other out. So I get this. And then third derivative, again, using the power rule in the chain rule, so I'm going to have uh, 
negative one over three minus x cubed times negative one times negative two. So negative two over three minus x cubed, fourth derivative, and maybe four is enough. So this will be at negative two times three over three minus x to the fourth. Now let's do one more. The pattern may be obvious to you already. Okay, so now let's go plug in three, not three, sorry, zero. Let's go plug in zero. This is McLaurin, not centered at three. So, so f of zero, well, this will be ln of three. f prime of zero, this will be negative one third. f double prime of zero, this will be negative one over three squared which I could write as nine, but I'm gonna leave it factored maybe for obvious reasons. It's to find the pattern as we go along. Third derivative evaluated zero. Well, this will be negative two over three cubed. Fourth derivative evaluated at zero. This will be negative two times three over three, the fourth power, and then the fifth derivative evaluated zero. So negative two times three times four over three to the fifth. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is the first coefficient is just ln of three. It doesn't, it's not a rational function, a rational expression. But after this, I see a pretty clear pattern. The numerator is always negative, but it does start picking up new factors, two, three, four. And then the bottom is just a power of three. Okay, and notice that in the, the fifth derivative, we have three to the fifth. So the bottom is just three to the nth power. And then the numerator in the in the fifth coefficient, I'm going up to four. So my factorial is one less than the current term. So I'm going to end up with um, negative n minus one factorial over three to the n. There's my formula for Nth, uh, nth derivative evaluated at zero. Okay. So that means that my series will look like this. I'm going to have the, the constant term is just ln of three. It doesn't fit into the, the, the formula very well. And so n will start with one, not zero, because this is the zeroth term. Infinity of, well, a uh, big fraction and factorial on bottom, and top, three to the n under negative n minus one factorial. It's a little cluttered, but we'll fix it. Uh, times x to the n power. Okay, so let's, let's simplify this a little bit. This is ln of three. Uh, I'm gonna take this, this minus sign and move it out here, just for convenience. It doesn't need to go, but that's fine. Minus the sum and goes from one to infinity. And I'm gonna rewrite this because I have this factorial divided by this factorial. So this is a big fraction or a long fraction, n minus one factorial over three to the n times, and of course this n factorial can be written as n times n minus one factorial. Okay, times x to the n, of course. So I can cancel these out. And then what I can do is I can group if I want this with this. I don't have to. I can write this as x over 3 to the n. It, that's optional if, if I want to do that. So we get ln of 3 uh, minus series n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n 3 to the n. times x to the n, or if I want ln of three minus series as n goes from one to infinity of one over n times x over three to the n. That'll just make the um, ratio test slightly easier.
So let's go look for, well, you know what? Let's go look for the graphs first. Let's go here. I've got the gra graph of ln of three minus x, and I've got this series programmed in, right? And n is zero, so we just have the, the constant approximation. If n is one, the linear, and the, and, and the quadratic cubic, and so forth. And you can see that, yeah, this, this approximates pretty well. It looks like from negative three to positive three, mostly like that's what I'm expecting. So let's go back and calculate the interval. Okay, so we'll use the ratio test. So rho equals the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of, and you might think, well, what are we going to do with this guy? We just don't worry about it. It's one term. We're care, we care about the tail of the term, really, for convergence. It's okay that we're starting at n equals 1. So we'll just use um, this, this guy here. We don't have to worry about the ln of 3. So, big fraction, 1 over n plus 1 times x over 3 to the n plus 1 power. All that over... 1 over n times x over 3 to the n. So that equals the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n plus 1 times x over 3. Okay, that absolute value can move uh, in front of the limit. So this equals the absolute value of x over 3 times the limit and goes to infinity of n over n plus 1, right? Now, of course, this limit is 1. So this all equals, oh, we're in our room here. This equals the absolute value of x over 3, which we want to be less than 1 for convergence. So negative 1 is less than x over 3. It's less than 1. Multiply three by uh, multiply three on all sides, so negative three is less than x is less than three. So my interval of convergence is negative three to three, and the center is zero as expected as as, as we were you know, started with because it's a Maclaurin series. Now there is more to this that we're not covering. Um, there's something called Taylor's theorem that involves the remainder calculation. Remember when we talked about uh, so for example, alternating series test, we talked about remainders of, of series. Well, with Taylor's theorem, you can do the same thing, and you, there's, there's more that you can do, but I'm not going to test you on that, so we'll leave that out of this discussion.